Okay, so this is going to be part two of that long little 40 minute video of me jawing, jacking around and taking my time. But teardown was under an hour. So we're going to go ahead and pull these off. As you can see, if you don't destroy these gaskets, I've got some rust on this one. You can actually see where the leaks are at, but if you've got these metal ones with the silicone on them, they tend to last a little bit longer. So I hate to say this, but if you buy the cheap ones and you see where it says R5, so my question is, is are they multi-sided? Well, yes, they are. So it's not really important on which side goes where. Um, but I can say if you buy the cheaper gaskets, they're not going to last very long. So we're going to do a little bit of snide remark cleanup here. in the situation to where this has water in it unless you vacuumed out or sucked all the water out you're gonna have a little bit of water in here now my my tip and trick would be as soon as you pull the radiator hose up top up here you can actually take a wet dry shop vac stick down in there and suck all that out now you pull the the line down at the bottom down here And then you stick a vacuum cleaner up in here, you can suck all that water out, or up here, and suck all that water out. But if you do that up here, you're going to have your thermostat in the way, so you're more than likely not going to get all that out of there. But in order to get as much water out of here so you don't end up with it in your cylinders, of course you still have your vacuum cleaner, but we have the top end of that engine broke down. So now we're cleaning it up, we're doing troubleshooting, we're checking to see if we have any cracks. Uh, I would take ether and spray ether in here because ether evaporates or take an evaporative cleaner. Clean all this up. Get in here with your your hydraulic lifters. Make sure you have a clean engine without a bunch of debris in it. Make sure you got a good clean surface so your new gaskets go in. Now mind you, we'll be not definitely inside the engine while we're doing this, or the engine bay, but we're not going to have a lot of space. And this is halfway through the process. So the next step is going to be putting everything back together. So. I'm going to do this rather quickly to show you how quickly it can be done versus taking my time. Yeah, I got my light over here and I'm knocking things over. So then here's the gaskets. if they don't go on them that way just flip them around make sure they go in the way they need to go in so there's little pins I'll show you that here in a second so that little pin right there and then that pin right there you take your gasket you line that pin up like that and then you do the same thing there now you take that off and you flip it around. You don't have a pin there. See? So there's no way you can put that on there. But you can literally take this one, put it on that side, take that one, put it on this side. It doesn't really make that much of a difference. You just need to be careful when lifting things like heads because they've got a little bit of weight on them. So I think they're 
Heads are like maybe 60 pounds, 55, 60 pounds or something like that, depending on the head. And of course, depending on the material that they're made from. Of course, you also need to be careful that when you put the head back on the deck, that you don't screw up your gasket by slamming it down on there or catching the corner on it. So, I would honestly say have somebody help you. So you can put one human being here, one human being here, and then one person walk it in and then set it down. Or you can take a block of wood, put a block of wood on here, set it down on the 2x4, and then reach in there, lift it up, and then just kind of slide it down onto the 2x4 without catching here. So we'll put it back together. Nice and secure. So if you remember me talking about leaving bolts and things like that, you'll see me grab a hold of the end bolt here, right there in my hand. And then you keep your hands free, line everything up, and voila. And then we'll take our bolts. Start everything by hand, and the reason why I suggest starting everything by hand is so you don't cross thread your bolts. Of course, you need to make sure that your heads are bolted down and everything's torqued down properly so that when you put your rockers back together, everything's under the proper tension. So then we'll repeat that process one, two, three, four, five, six times. So add a minute or two. So the entire process, I would say probably add another half hour to an hour in comparison to what I'm doing. Now we're going to put our push rod back in place. So it's going to be the same procedure, only backwards. We're going to loosen up the rockers. And then 
we're going to take the corresponding push rods. This time we can actually see what's going on down there. Make sure they go in the right place. We don't really necessarily want a push rod in the wrong area. Then you want to line everything up. And then snug it down with your fingers. So a tip with rotating your motor, um, put blocks under your tires and put your vehicle in neutral. So the thing is with uh, doing it that way, uh, you can actually put more tension on that front crankshaft if you do it that way. Um, I've actually heard of some old timers actually using the starter to rotate the engine. Um, it's actually sometimes a bit more difficult to, to line things up properly when you're using the starter or your bump starting to raise number one or number two or open the valve or close the valve. Um, I would actually suggest uh, using a wrench and doing it from the front. Um, it's inside of the vehicle it's a bit more difficult for a single person to do that. So if you're by yourself and you're doing this, you're gonna you're gonna have to figure out some way of doing that. Now, if you're in something like a van, that's gonna be a bit of a pain in the ass because you're gonna have a firewall sitting right here. So in order to get to that front of that engine, that's gonna be a sort of a pain. Putting valves in isn't that much of a, an issue. The reason why uh, torquing valves down is, is sort of a tedious process or time consuming process is because you have to rotate the engine. Sometimes, I mean, there there have been a lot of issues, you know, um, teaching people how to do things, and you know, people and their attention spans, and and people with their lack of attention spans, and and whatnot, and people, you know, trying to manipulate the rest of their coworkers to do the jobs for them, and you know, somebody that, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who really can't. They can't stick with something when they start something, you know, they, they have to walk away from it or, or, you know, they have to take their time or the pace in which that they're doing what it is that they're doing is so slow. Because they don't feel that they have to do things fast. Or they have all the time in the world in order to do things, you know? you know. I mean, for instance, you take somebody who actually owns the garage uh, that you drop your vehicle off with, and they say, yeah, we'll, we'll get on that. And then we, they tell you, well, we can't really tell you how long it's going to take because we don't know what the problem is. And, you know, they can't really give you any definite answers. And you drop your vehicle off, and then they have to go run errands or, you know, go pick up the kids from school or they have to go do grocery shopping while your car or your truck is you know sitting in their garage or, or like the whole thing it was kind of interesting I 
I dropped the vehicle off to have an alignment done. And I guess the the mechanic that was at the service station that was doing the alignments, of course you have to have machinery to do an alignment these days. I mean you can get close but it's usually better just to have a someone throw it up on the rack and have it done like your inspection. You can't really do an inspection on your own. You know, you're, you're a licensed mechanic and things like that. And the interesting thing is, is you necessarily don't have to be a licensed mechanic in order to have an, a state DOT inspection license. I mean, for instance, a, a muffler shop or a tire shop where somebody who's not really a mechanic but they've been trained to replace your tires or they know how to do exhausts on vehicles but they're not necessarily a licensed mechanic and you know they they kind of argue with you about well this needs to be fixed and that needs to be fixed and you're sitting there looking at somebody and you go kind of going i got 25 years experience as a mechanic and you're telling me what i need to do you know what i'm saying so when you run into situations like that, it gets a bit frustrating and it gets a bit irritating because, you know, you're going to sit there and argue with that person and you're just kind of, your mind is completely blown by the fact that you have somebody who doesn't even have a mechanic's license that's actually telling you, an experienced mechanic, that those drips or... The residue of the oil that's on the back of the engine back there is from you fixing the vehicle and they're saying that your vehicle is leaking fluids and <laughs> you know what I'm saying so there, there are some some instances that were so irritating in my life involving things of that nature that Instead of blowing up and getting pissed off, I just, I just shut up and laughed at him. You know, I mean, I, it's, it's like the situation, you roll up into a garage to get a vehicle inspected, and you're not the owner of the vehicle, and you've got parts in the trunk. And the owner of a vehicle is saying that, yeah, it'll pass, it'll pass. And then you get there, and the inspector says your headlight's flickering. And they won't pass it because of the fact that the headlight has a flicker to it. You know, and this is on a vehicle that has a, a bulb versus an LED. You know. There was a, another instance where I took a trailer to go get a, a trailer inspected and uh, the running lights, it had a whole bunch of running lights on the side of it. I think there was probably maybe 10 running lights on each side and one of them wasn't bright enough. So the individual in the inspection say, said, actually quoted his mechanics license and said I've been a mechanic for many years you know blah this and blah that and you have a major electrical problem on this trailer and I'm kinda of going no it's just the ground and the individual started arguing with me saying that he had you know just went to a mechanics garage or a mechanics college and he went to a technical college and he spent like six seven months and you know i didn't spend a year in mechanics garage to have some just some person off the street tell me i don't know what i'm talking about and by that time i had about 15 years experience in mechanic work on my belt but i didn't <laughs> i didn't say anything to him i just kind of laughed about it so now the next step is after you get all this bolted down of course we've already torqued our heads down so we want to go through the valve train procedure on torquing the valves down with making sure that our valves 
and our push rides are in the proper location as well as in the seats that they should be in. So then we want to go in and torque down our valve train and we want to do it properly by either opening or closing each valve as we do this to make sure that we either A have tension or B don't have tension on the valve. So you'll need to go through vehicle specifics and you'll need to actually get a book and look through that information to get that information and make sure that information is proper. But what you're going to do is you're going to rotate the engine until the valve is either open or closed depending on what is required for the vehicle. I'm not going to go into details and I'm not going to tell you if it is open or it is closed. And then you need to take your torque wrench if it be foot pounds or inch pounds and then go ahead and torque each bolt down properly. Okay, and then after you run the engine, make sure you come back out and go and check your torques again. Always make sure that when you put new material, new bolts, new nuts, gaskets, and all that, make sure you retorque everything a month later, a couple weeks later, three months later, yada, yada, yada. So now I'm going to show you how to put the gaskets back in and then put the plenum back on it. So we're using used gaskets today, but in your instance, you're going to be using a new gasket. I've done this countless times. Uh, you want to make sure everything's cleaned up. Uh, the wonderful thing about newer vehicles is we're not using tar paper for gaskets anymore. These gaskets actually have a little ear. These gaskets actually have a little tab like that that fits in to the block. So if you see that little hole right there, there's actually two of them. There's one over there. There's one right there. And then there's one right there. So that's what those go into. One is in the front. This one goes in the back since it's got a curve on it. And this one is L-shaped and it goes in the front. So you can actually see there's an L shape right there. And then back here, there's a curved shape. So you really can't screw those up, but it is possible. Okay, so these are used gaskets. Okay, now how I do this is I'll take these busted up, tired ass gaskets. But also, you see your water jacket holes right there and right there. You put them in like that. If you put them in upside down, you can't you can't mistake in how they go. They actually fit in there like that, but then you'll be blocking off your water journals. So you want to flip those over, make sure they're in the right locations. So if you look down here, you can actually see that there's tabs on everything. So if you see that you see that tab right there. And then you see that tab, those tabs kind of fit and they kind of lock in. So then you look over here, you can see the same thing. You see that head gasket and you see that tab kind of locks it in place so it doesn't move around. You can use RV sealant, but in the instance, if you've ever taken apart an oil pump or if you've ever taken apart a water pump and both the oil pump and the water pump are clear, completely clogged because of RV sealant, you might want to kind of step away from the RV sealant. But a very thin bead um, in accordance with the thickness of the bead that was on the head gaskets is all you need. Uh, you don't really need that much. Or just a little bit on there to goop it on there to stick it in place is, is basically it. Of course with your front and rear goes in there like that. I would actually suggest before you put this down put a little bead of RV sealant right there in the front of the motor. So right here is where you need to put that. I'll get you closer to make sure there's no screw ups with that. So right there is where you need to put that bead of RV sealant. Right there where this gasket meets this gasket. Because that's usually a lot of the engines that I've ever done work on, that's where I've seen that leak at. Of course if you uh, do a pressure in your water jackets, 
and things of that nature. Sometimes you'll find that if you put too much pressure inside that radiator, you'll actually blow out right here and right here. this up if you've got bolts on it or if you've uh, got your intake plenum and you pick it up like this and you set it down it should fall right in place you shouldn't have any problems with it and you see I left the bolts in it so then we're going through the procedure Tightening down the intake on them. And I'm going to do the same thing with this. I'm just going to snug it down. I am not going to tighten it down because of the fact that you actually have a sequence to where you tighten, you snug everything down, and then you draw this down a pound or two, go to the other side, that side, that side, this side, this side, this side, this side. And you work your way back and forth until you put this put the proper amount of pressure on this aluminum because you will snap off this ear. If you snap off this ear right here, you can't just drive it. You're actually going to have a lot of fluids leaking out because that water jacket is right there. You know. So you do a torque, torque, torque and then adjust whether it be foot pounds or inch pounds. I believe that the aluminum is inch pounds. Don't take my word for it. Get a reference manual and make sure you have that information. So don't do it the way I'm doing it. Please. I'm actually going to tell you not to do it this way. You actually have a method for doing this. And the reason why it's like that is because of the fact that if you put too much pressure on the front of it, you'll actually snap the aluminum and you'll break the aluminum because aluminum is very brittle. Very, very fragile stuff. It's not like steel. So the next step is going to be putting the valve covers back on and putting the valve covers get in. And preference would be brand new valve cover gaskets or quote unquote if you have a uh, upper quality valve cover gasket to use one that's reusable versus using the cork. I understand the cork are like 15, 12 dollars but I would rather spend the $20 on a good valve cover set just to make sure that I don't have oil running down here and catching on fire in the exhaust. So a little trick that I have is this. You take the the valve cover and orientation on how you're going to hold it. Set it up like that. Hold that gasket with your fingers and then take a bolt. Put a bolt through it so that that gasket is lined up and then put it on. set it down, that bolt goes right into that hole, and then take another bolt, push the valve cover up, and then put the rest of your bolts in. Now if you remember where the longer ones and the shorter ones went, the longer ones have a clip attached, and a lot of times all you need is a screwdriver 
or just unscrew that clip because that clip is sort of a pain in the butt. So I would suggest an aftermarket wire loom dress kit or you can use zip ties in order to keep things clean and up off your exhaust manifold. So make sure you thread everything in by hand so you don't cross thread things. I mean honestly there's no point in spending extra money unless of course you like doing that. And this is the fighting method where you have to put everything in here and then line it up and then put your screws in. But you can see it's Pretty straightforward. I mean, it's not really that complicated. It's actually kind of a big jigsaw puzzle, if you ask me. No need to be overwhelmed by vehicle mechanics. Yeah, you're going to get dirty. But that's why we have hand cleaners. Now your valve covers. You can over tighten your valve covers, but if you have this type of gasket on here, it's uh, pretty much foolproof. I'll run them down till they make contact and just give it a, a little bit of a quarter turn. And just like your spark plugs, you don't have to you don't have to wrench on things. I mean, you don't have to get them so damn tight that you break them loose when you try to remove them the next time. It's not a it's not a show of strength on, you know, I was I was able to tighten this up or tighten this bolt up so damn tight that the next person, you know, I sold my vehicle to my buddy and my buddy can't can't break those damn things loose because of the fact that I tighten, you know. So you know, all you're doing is you're you're costing your buddy time time and money by doing things like that. So that when you run into a situation where you have something that doesn't want to grab, and if you look at those threads, they're not exactly perfect. And you can feel that. Honestly, you can't actually feel that. So I didn't want to go in that one, but it went in that one. You know, it's kind of interesting, whenever I was younger, there's pretty much not a lot that I didn't know about vehicles, and I actually learned about the major components of vehicles by putting models together in my room, you know. Um, even though there's some, you know, technical issues about quote-unquote model glue, and the problems that model glue does cause in uh, the development of the human brain, It taught me something, you know, not the model glue, but... So now I'm going to put together the front end of the engine. So if you remember correctly, here I'll go ahead and move you. That would make more sense. So this is the part where you'd have to 
manipulate yourself into Manipulate yourself into some of those interesting pages in the Kama Sutra. So, we were a 14. So we're going to do this in the exact opposite, of course. In this situation, your, uh, your thermostat housing and your thermostat are going to be already connected. Uh, this right here, I showed you a little tip and trick on that. We'll, we'll go through that again. Now, this bolt right here... Actually, going to find a couple of these, especially if you work on dodges. I'll get a close up on it. It's got a regular head on it, like a regular bolt, but then it's got a star key pattern on the inside. I've actually found these in here. So we'll take the bolt that goes in there, and we'll pull that one out. So here's the bolt that was in this one. They're, uh, they're a bit different. So, the transmission also has one of those. So the transmission pan, you'll find that very same bolt on the transmission pan. So then you'll also put your coil back in place. If you took your coil out. So if you're in a van, you'll be outside the engine compartment, probably hanging over the front of the vehicle doing it this way, unless you can reach it from the inside. If your firewall is right here, then you might be able to get around to get to it, uh, depending on what type of maker model that you are driving. And we have our long, funky-ass extension. And it helps things out. the quick wrench always makes things very handy what I mean by quick wrench is that a ratcheting wrench all right and the next step is going to be this so if you remember correctly the small bend was here, and all you got to do is take it, give it a pop, and it's in. Not that complicated, pretty easy. And then your accessory, which we have all the bolts, and first thing you want to do is you want to take the one that you left in there, you want to pull that one out. Line everything up. Of course, you want to put your hose clamps on there. And of course, if you don't have your heads in the proper orientation, or something isn't right, this is not going to fit on there like it should. The problem I'm having is that bolt is in the way. So, that would be the reason why 
that that hole right there for this bolt is where it is because when you go to put this bracket back in when you go to put this bracket back in that bolt's going to be in the way of course this bracket has torque specs if it doesn't show torque specs torque specs on the accessory bracket on the front of the engine then more than likely it's just going to be make sure that you snug it down to a proper tightness, but you don't want to get these so tight that you can't break them loose. So my philosophy is if you're using your bicep and your pectoral muscle, that might be a bit too tight for aluminum. If you're just using your forearm and your elbow and your tricep, you should be good to go. But in a situation where you have something like that, that doesn't want to go in, you want to back it off, take a look at it. In this instance, I have rust on the end of that, and rust is sort of a pain in the ass. So we have a bolt fighting me right here. And sometimes that's a sign that quote unquote either you got some buildup in there, or you got the wrong size bolt, or you got some sort of strip threads going on. But the threads aren't stripped. It's just dirty. So if you've got a leak or something like that, and you've got a bunch of water deposits or water buildup in there, sometimes that, uh, that's what happens. Sometimes you got to back it out, put it back in there. Ordinarily, I would think I was stripping that out, but there's a lot of rust in that. Of course, there's a water, there's a bit of a water issue here. So the the water jacket is right about in here, so that water would come out and drain down on that. So we've got everything tightened up. We're going to go ahead and put this pulley on here. So there's also a torque spec with this pulley, so make sure that you have that information. If you can't find a torque spec for this pulley, give it a nice little tweak, give it a spin. So the dipstick too is going to be the next thing. If I remember correctly, the dipstick tube was a 13. Usually I'm a lot uh, faster with uh, 
putting everything back together because you know I'm basically done with it. Uh, it's sort of something that's kind of stuck with my head. Take your time and pay attention to what's going on when you're pulling it apart so you know how to fix it when uh, you get everything taken apart and get everything cleaned up. So now you'd want to put your accessories back on. You will put your alternator back in. You want to put your... So if you remember correctly we had our our AC pump wired up over here out of the way because of the fact that our AC pump hose goes across this way or if it goes this way then it's wired up over on this side. So then our alternator, go ahead and put our alternator wire back on there, go ahead and put everything, uh, bring your wire loom back up front and then we'll flip around to the other side. We'll put that distributor in. So the distributor is pretty much trouble shot because one side of that is round, which is right there, and the other side of that is square. So you can't really screw that one up. I mean, there is a possibility, but always make sure that you put everything back in the way it was prior to you getting to it. Now that's got a little catch in it, so there's a notch there for it. Of course, this distributor turns because it's not bolted down properly. So I would suggest if you're running an off-road vehicle, take a, a little bit of silicone, go all the way around that so that you don't get any water in your distributor. And that silicone will mold in there, but you don't want to put so much silicone on there that it's going to screw everything up. So, if you made the decision on pulling your oil sending unit, or your oil pressure sensor, 